Section 15 of Animal Heroes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Animal Heroes by Ernest Thompson Seton. The Legend of the White Reindeer. Skoll, skoll, for Norway skoll, sing ye the song of the Van Dam Troll. When I am hiding Norway's luck, on a white store buck comes riding, riding. Bleak, black, deep, and cold is Utrevan, a long pocket of glacial water, a crack in the globe, a wrinkle in the high Norwegian mountains, blocked with another mountain and flooded with a frigid flood three thousand feet above its mother sea and yet no closer to its father's son around its cheerless shore is a belt of stunted trees that sends a long tail up the high valley till it dwindles away to sticks and moss as it also does some halfway up the granite hills that rise a thousand feet encompassing the lake this is the limit of trees the end of the growth of wood the birch and the willow are the last to drop out of the long fight with frost their miniature thickets are noisy with the cries of fieldfire pipit and ptarmigan but these are left behind on nearing the upper plateau where shade of rock and so of wind are all that take their place the chilly hoyfeld rolls away a rugged rocky plain with great patches of snow in all the deeper hollows and the distance blocked by snowy peaks that rise and roll in whiter gleam till dim and dazzling in the north uplifts the jotunheim the home of spirits of glaciers and of the lasting snow the treeless stretch is one vast attest to the force of heat each failure of the sun by one degree is marked by a lower realm of life the northern slope of each hollow is less boreal than its southern side. The pine and spruce have given out long ago. The mountain ash went next. The birch and willow climbed up half the slope. Here, nothing grows but creeping plants and moss. The plain itself is pale grayish green, one vast expanse of reindeer moss, but warmed at spots into orange by great beds of polytrichum and in sunnier nooks deepened to a herbal green the rocks that are scattered everywhere are of delicate lilac but each is variegated with spreading frill edge plasters of gray green lichen or orange powder streaks and beauty spots of black these rocks have great power to hold the heat so that each of them is surrounded by a little belt of heat loving plants that could not otherwise live so high dwarfed representatives of the birch and willow both are here hugging the genial rock as an old french habitant hugs his stove in winter time spreading their branches over it instead of in the frigid air a foot away is seen a chillier belt of heath and farther off colder where none else can grow is the omnipresent gray-green reindeer moss that gives its color to the upland the hollows are still filled with snow, though now it is June, but each of these white expanses is shrinking, spending itself in ice-cold streams that somehow reach the lake. These snowflukes show no sign of life, not even the red snow tinge, and around each is a belt of barren earth to testify that life and warmth can never be divorced birdless and lifeless the gray-green snow-pied waste extends over all the stretch that is here between the timberline and the snow-line above which winter never quits its hold farther north both come lower till the timberline is at the level of the sea and all the land is in that treeless belt called the tundra in the old world and barrens in the new and that everywhere is the home of the reindeer the realm of the reindeer moss. One. In and out it flew, in and out, 
over the water and under, as the Varshimla, the leader doe of the reindeer herd, walked past on the vernal banks, and it sang, Skol, Skol, Gamle Norga Skol, and more about a white reindeer and Norway's good luck, as though the singer were gifted with special insight. When old Svegum built the Van Dam on the lower Hoifeld, just above the Utrevan, and set his Riebsten a-going, he supposed that he was the owner of it all. But someone was there before him, and in and out of the spouting stream this someone dashed and sang songs that he made up to fit the place and the time. He skipped from Shiga to Shiga of the wheel, and did many things which Svegum could set down only to luck, whatever that is, and some said that Svegum's luck was a wheel troll, a water fairy, with a brown coat and a white beard, one that lived on land or in water as he pleased. But most of Svegum's neighbors saw only a Foska, the little waterfall bird that came each year and danced in the stream or dived where the pool is deep. It may be both are right, for some of the very oldest peasants will tell you that a fairy troll may take the form of a man or the form of a bird. Only this bird lived a life no bird can live, and sang songs that men never had sung in Norway. Wonderful vision had he, and sights he saw that man never saw. For the field fair would build before him, and the lemming fed its brood under his very eyes. Eyes were they to see, for the dark speck on Sulontin that man could barely glimpse was a reindeer, with half-shed coat. To him, in the green slime on the Vondren, was a beautiful green pasture of a banquet spread. Oh, man is so blind, and makes himself so hated. But Fosca harmed none, so none were afraid of him. Only he sang, and his songs are sometimes mixed with fun and prophecy, or perhaps a little scorn. From the top of the tassel birch, he could mark the course of the Von Dam stream past the Nistuan hamlet to lose itself in the gloomy waters of Utrevan, or by a higher flight he could see across the barren upland that rolled to Jotunheim in the north. The great awakening was on now. The springtime had already reached the woods. The valleys were a throb with life, new birds coming from the south, winter sleepers reappearing, and the reindeer that had wintered in the lower woods should soon again be seen on the uplands. Not without a fight do the frost giants give up the place so long their own. A great battle was in progress, but the sun was slowly, surely winning, and driving them back to their Jotunheim. At every hollow and shady place they made another stand, or sneak back by night, only to suffer another defeat. Hard hitters these, as they are stubborn fighters. Many a granite rock was split and shattered by their blows in reckless fight, so that its inner fleshy tints were shown and warmly gleamed among the grey-green rocks that dotted the plain, like the countless flocks of Tua. More or less of these may be found at every place a battle brunt, and straggled along the slope of Sulatin was a host that reached for half a mile. But stay, these moved. Not rocks were they, but living creatures. They drifted along erratically, yet one way, all up the wind. They swept out of sight in a hollow, to reappear on a ridge much nearer, and serried there against the sky. We marked their branching horns, and knew them for the reindeer in their home. The band came drifting our way, feeding like sheep, grunting like only themselves. Each one found a grazing spot, stood there till it was cleared off, then trotted on crackling hoofs to the front in search of another. So the band was ever changing in rank and form. But one there was that was always at or near the van, a large and well-favored simla, or hind. However much the band might change and spread, she was in the forefront, and the observant would soon have seen signs that she had had an influence over the general movement, that she, indeed, was the leader. Even the big bucks and their huge velvet-clad antlers admitted this untitular control, and if one, in a spirit of independence, evinced a disposition to lead elsewhere, 
he soon found himself uncomfortably alone. The Vashimla, or leading hind, had kept the band hovering for the last week or two along the timberline, going higher each day to the bearing uplands, where the snow was clearing and the deer flies were blown away. As the pasture zone had climbed, she had fouled in her daily foraging, returning to the sheltered woods at sundown, for the wild things fear the cold night wind even as man does. But now the deer flies were rife in the woods, and the rocky hillside nooks warm enough for the nightly bivouac, so the woodland was deserted. Probably the leader of a band of animals does not consciously pride itself on leadership, yet has an uncomfortable sensation when not followed. But there are times, with all, when solitude is sought. The Varshimla had been fat and well through the winter, yet now was listless, and lingered with drooping head as the grazing herd moved past her. Sometimes she stood gazing blankly while the unchewed bunch of moss hung from her mouth, then roused to go on to the front as before, but the spells of vacant stare and the hankering to be alone grew stronger. She turned downward to seek the birchwoods, but the whole band turned with her. She stood stock still with head down. They grazed and grunted past, leaving her like a statue against the hillside. When all had gone on, she slunk quietly away, walked a few steps, looked about, made a pretense of grazing, snuffed the ground, looked after the herd, and scanned the hills, then downward fared toward the sheltering woods. Once, as she peered over a bank, she sighted another Simla, a doe reindeer, uneasily wandering by itself. But the Varshimla wished not for company. She did not know why, but she felt that she must hide away somewhere. She stood still until the other had passed on, then turned aside and went with faster steps and less wavering, till she came in view of Utrevan, away down by the little stream, the turns old Svegum's Ribsten. Up above the dam she waded across the limpid stream, for deep-laid and sure is the instinct of a wild animal to put running water between itself and those it shuns. Then, on the farther bank, now bare and slightly green, she turned, and passing in and out among the twisted trunks, she left the noisy Van Damme. On the higher ground beyond she paused, looking this way and that, went on a little, but returned, and here, completely shut in by softly painted rocks and birches wearing little springtime hangers, she seemed inclined to rest. Yet not to rest, for she stood uneasily this way and that, driving away the flies that settled on her legs, heeding not at all the growing grass, and thinking she was hid from all the world. But nothing escapes the Fosca. He had seen her leave the herd, and now he sat on a gorgeous rock that overhung, and sang as though he had waited for this, and knew that the fate of the nation might turn on what passed in this far glen. He sang, Skol, skol, for Norway skol, sing ye the song of the Van Damme troll, when I am hiding, Norway's luck, on a white storbuck comes riding, riding. There are no storks in Norway. And yet, an hour later, there was a wonderful little reindeer lying beside the Varshimla. She was brushing his coat, licking and mothering him, proud and happy, as though this was the first little Renskov ever born. There might be hundreds born in the herd that month, but probably no more like this one, for he was snowy white, and the song of the singer on the painted rock was about, Good luck, good luck, and a white storbuck as though he foresaw clearly the part that the white calf was to play when he grew to be a starbuck. But another wonder now came to pass. Before an hour there was a second little calf, a brown one this time. Strange things happen, and hard things are done when they needs must. Two hours later, when the Varshimla led the white calf away from the place, there was no brown calf, only some flattened rags with calf hair on them. The mother was wise, better one strongling than two weaklings. Within a few days, the Simla once more led the band, and running by her side was the white calf. Varshimla considered him in all things, 
so that he really set the pace for the band, which suited very well all the mothers that now had calves with him. Big, strong, and wise was the Varshimla in the pride of her strength, and this white calf was the flower of her prime. He often ran ahead of his mother as she led the herd, and Rur, coming on them one day, laughed aloud at the sight as they passed, old and young, fat Simla and antlet Stobok, a great brown herd, all led, as it seemed, by a little white calf. So they drifted away to the high mountains, to be gone all summer, gone to be taught by the spirits who dwell where the black loon laughs on the ice, said Leif of the lower dale. But Svegum, who had always been among the reindeer, said, Their mothers are the teachers, even as ours are. When the autumn came, old Svegum saw a moving snow flock far off on the brown moorland. But the troll saw a white yearling, a neck book, and when they ranged alongside of Utrevan to drink, the still sheet seemed fully to reflect the white one, though it barely sketched in the others with the dark hills behind. Many a little calf had come that spring, and had drifted away on the moss barrens to come back no more, for some were weaklings and some were fools. Some fell by the way, for that is law, and some would not learn the rules, and so died. But the white calf was the strongest of them all, and he was wise, so he learned of his mother, who was wisest of them all. He learned that the grass on the sun side of a rock is sweet, and though it looks the same in the dark hollows, it is there worthless. He learned that when his mother's hoofs crackled, he must be up and moving. When all the herd's hoofs crackled, there was danger, and he must keep by his mother's side. For this crackling is like the whistling of a whistler duck's wings, it is to keep the kinds together. He learned that where the little bombwood bloomster hangs its cotton tufts is dangerous bog, that the harsh cackle of the ptarmigan means that close at hand are eagles, is dangerous for fawn as for birds. He learned that the little trollberries are deadly, that when the vera flies come stinging he must take refuge on a snow patch, and that of all animal smells only that of his mother was to be fully trusted. He learned that he was growing. His flat calf sides and big joints were changing to the full barrel and clean limbs of the yearling, and the little bumps which began to show in his head when he was only a fortnight old were now sharp, hard spikes that could win and fight. More than once they had smelt that dreaded destroyer of the north that men call the Yarv or Wolverine, and one day, as this danger scent came suddenly and in great strength, a huge blot of dark brown sprang rumbling from a rocky ledge, and straight for the foremost, the white calf. His eye caught the flash of a whirling shaggy mass, with gleaming teeth and eyes, hot breath and ferocious. Blank horror set his hair on end, his nostrils fleered in fear, but before he fled there rose within another feeling, one of anger at the breaker of his peace, a sense that swept all fear away braced his legs, and set his horns a charge. The brown brute landed with a deep-chested growl to be received on the young one's spikes. They pierced him deeply, but the shock was overmuch. It bore the white one down, and he might yet have been killed, but that his mother alert never near now charged the attacking monster, and heavier, better arm, she hurled and speared him to the ground and the white calf with a very demon glare in his once mild eyes charged too and even after the wolverine was a mere hairy mass and his mother had retired to feed he came snorting out his rage to drive his spikes into the hateful thing till his snowy head was stained with his adversary's blood thus he showed that below the ox-like calm exterior was the fighting beast that he was like the men of the north rugged square-built calm slow to wrath but when aroused seeing red when they ranked together by the lake that fall the fulskal sang his old song when i am hiding norway's luck on a white store buck comes riding riding as though this was something he had awaited then disappeared no one knew where old sveggum had seen it flying through the stream as birds fly through the air walking in the bottom of a deep pond 
as a ptarmigan walks on the rocks, living as no bird can live. And now the old man said it had simply gone southward for the winter. But old Svegum could neither read nor write. How should he know? End of section 15section sixteen of animal heroes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nemo animal heroes by ernest thompson seaton the legend of the white reindeer two each springtime when the reindeer passed over Svegum's mill run, as they moved from the lowland woods to the bleaker shores of Utrevan, Dofoskal was there to sing about the white storbuk, which each year became more truly the leader. That first spring he stood little higher than a hare. When he came to drink in the autumn, his back was above the rock where Svegum's stream enters Utrevan. Next year he barely passed under the stunted birch. In the third year, the false call on the painted rock was looking up, not down at him as he passed. This was the autumn when Rul and Svegum sought the Hoyfeld to round up their half-wild herd and select some of the strongest for the sled. There was but one opinion about the storbuck. Higher than the others, heavier, white as snow, with a mane that swept the shallow drifts, breasted like a horse, and with horns like a storm-grown oak, he was king of the herd, and might easily be king of the road. There are two kinds of deer-breakers, as there are two kinds of horse-breakers. One that tames and teaches the animal, and gets a spirited, friendly helper. One that aims to break its spirit, and gets only a sullen slave, ever ready to rebel and wreak its hate. Many a lap and many a Norsk has paid with his life for brutality to his reindeer, and Rule's days were shortened by his own pulk grin. But Svegum was of a gentler sort. To him fell the training of the white storebook. It was slow, for the book resented all liberties from man, as he did from his brothers, but kindness, not fear, was the power that tamed him. And when he'd learned to obey and glory in the sled race, it was a noble sight to see the great white, mild-eyed beast striding down the long snow stretch of Utrevan, the steam jetting from his nostrils, the snow swirling up before like the curling waves on a steamer's bow, sled, driver, and deer, all dim and flying white. Then came the Yuletide Fair, with the races on the ice, and Utrevan for once was gay. The sullen hills about re-echoed with merry shouting. The reindeer races were first, with many a mad mischance for laughter. Rul himself was there with his swiftest sled deer, a tall, dark five-year-old in his primest prime, but over-eager, over-brutal, he harried the sullen splendid slave till in mid-race just when in a way to win it turned at a cruel blow and rule took refuge under the upturned sled until it had vented its rage against the wood and so he lost the race and the winner was the young white storbuck then he won the five-mile race around the lake and for each triumph svegum hung a little silver bell on his harness so that now he ran and won to merry music. Then came the horse races. Running races these, the reindeer only trots, and when Balder, the victor horse, received his ribbon and his owner the purse, came Svegum, with all his winnings in his hand, and said, Ho, oh, Lars, thine is a fine horse, but mine is a better storebuck. Let us put our winnings together and race each his beast for all. A wren against a racehorse. Such a race was never seen till now. Off at the pistol crack they flew. 
ho boulder ho hi boulder away shot the beautiful racer and the storebook striding at a slower trot was left behind ho boulder hi storebook how the people cheered as the horse went bounding and gaining but he had left the line at his top speed the storebooks rose as he flew faster faster the pony ceased again a mile whirled by the gap began to close the pony had overspurted at the start but the storebook was warming to his work striding evenly swiftly faster yet as fegum cried in encouragement oh storebuck good storebuck or talked to him only with a gentle rein at the turning point the pair were neck and neck then the pony though well driven and well shod slipped on the ice and thenceforth held back as though in fear so the storebuck steamed away the pony and his driver were far behind when a roar from every human throat in fielfield told that the storebuck had passed the wire and won the race and yet all this was before the white wren had reached the years of his full strength and speed once that day Rule essayed to drive the storebuck. They set off at a good pace, the white book ready, responsive to the single rein, and his mild eyes veiled by his drooping lashes. But, without any reason, other than the habit of brutality, Rule struck him. In a moment there was a change. The racer's speed was checked. All four legs braced forward till he stood. The drooping lids were raised the eyes rolled there was a green light in them now three puffs of steam were jetted from each nostril rule shouted then scenting danger quickly upset the sled and hid beneath the storebook turned to charge the sled sniffing and tossing the snow with his foot but little knuta svegum's son ran forward and put his arms around the storebook's neck then the fierce look left the reindeer's eye, and he suffered the child to lead him quietly back to the starting point. Beware, O oh driver, the reindeer, too, sees red. This was the coming of the white stoolbuck for the folk of Fielfjell. In the two years that followed, he became famous throughout that country as Fegum Stoolbuck, and many a strange exploit was told of him. In twenty minutes, he could carry old Svegum around the six-mile rim of Utrevan. When the snowslide buried all the village of Holaker, it was the storebook that brought the word for help to Optostrola, and returned again over the forty miles of deep snow in seven hours, to carry brandy, food, and promise of speedy aid. When over-venturesome, young Nuta Svegumsen broke through the new thin ice of Utrevan, his cry for help brought the storebook to the rescue, for he was the gentlest of his kind, and always ready to come at call. He brought the drowning boy in triumph to the shore, and, as they crossed the Vondam stream, there was the troll-bird to sing, Good luck, good luck, with the white storebook, after which he disappeared for months, doubtless dived into some subaqueous cave to feast and revel all winter. Although Sphegum, did not believe it was so three how often is the fate of kingdoms given into child hands or even committed to the care of bird or beast a she-wolf nursed the roman empire a wren pecking crumbs on a drumhead aroused the orange army it is said and ended the stuart reign in britain little wonder then that to a noble reindeer book should be committed the fate of Norway, that the troll on the wheel should have reason in his rhyme. These were troublous times in Scandinavia. Evil men, traitors at heart, were sowing dissension between the brothers Norway and Sweden. Down with the Union was becoming the popular cry. O oh, unwise peoples, if only you could have been by Svegum's wheel to hear the troll when he sang. The raven and the lion, 
they held the beer at bay but he picked the bones of both when they quarrelled by the way threats of civil war of a fight for independence were heard throughout norway meetings were held more or less secretly and at each of them was someone with well-filled pockets and glib tongue to enlarge on the country's wrongs and promise assistance from an outside irresistible power as soon as they showed that they meant to strike for freedom no one openly named the power that was not necessary it was everywhere felt and understood men who were real patriots began to believe in it their country was wronged here was one to set her right men whose honor was beyond question became secret agents of this power the state was honeycombed in mine society was a tangle of plots the king was helpless though his only wish was for the people's welfare honest and straightforward what could he do against this far-reaching machination the very advisers by his side were corrupted through mistaken patriotism the idea that they were playing into the hands of the foreigner certainly never entered into the minds of these dupes at least not those of the rank and file one or two tried selected and bought by the arch enemy knew the real object in view and the chief of these was borgrevink a former landsman of norlands a man of unusual gifts a member of the stolting a born leader he might have been prime minister long ago but for the distrust inspired by several unprincipled dealings soured by what he considered want of appreciation balked in his ambition he was a ready tool when the foreign agent sounded him at first his patriotism had to be sopped but that necessity disappeared as the game went on perhaps he alone of the whole far-reaching conspiracy was prepared to strike at the union for the benefit of the foreigner plans were being perfected army officers being secretly misled and won over by the specious talk of their country's wrongs and each move made by borgrevink more surely the head of it all when a quarrel between himself and the deliverer occurred over the question of recompense wealth untold they were willing to furnish but regal power never the quarrel became more acute borgrevink continued to attend all meetings but was ever more careful to centre all power in himself and even prepared to turn round to the king's party if necessary to further his ambition the betrayal of his followers would purchase his own safety but proofs he must have and he set about getting signatures to a declaration of rights which was simply a veiled confession of treason many of the leaders he had deluded into signing this before the meeting at Lardstolson. here they met in the early winter some twenty of the patriots some of them men of position all of them men of brains and power here in the close and stifling parlor they planned discussed and questioned great hopes were expressed great deeds were forecast in that stove hot room outside against the fence in the winter night was a great white reindeer harnessed to a sled but lying down with his head doubled back on his side as he slept calm unthoughtful ox-like which seemed likelier to decide the nation's fate the earnest thinkers indoors or the ox-like sleeper without which seemed more vital to israel the bearded council in king saul's tent or the light-hearted shepherd-boy hurling stones across the brook at bethlehem at laudstolson it was as before deluded by borgrevink's eloquent plausibility all put their heads in the noose their lives and country in his hands seeing in this treacherous monster a very angel of self-sacrificing patriotism all no not all old Svegum was there he could neither read nor write 
That was his excuse for not signing. He could not read a letter in a book, but he could read something of the hearts of men. As the meeting broke up, he whispered to Axel Tonbeck, Is his own name on that paper? And Axel, starting at the thought, said, No. Then said Svegum, I don't trust that man. They ought to know of this at Nistuin, for there was to be the really important meeting. But how to let them know was the riddle. Borgrevink was going there at once with his fast horses. Svegum's eye twinkled as he nodded toward the stoolbook, standing tied to the fence. Borgrevink leapt into his sleigh and went off at speed, for he was a man of energy. Svegum took the bells from the harness, untied the reindeer, stepped into the pool. He swung the single rein, clucked to the storebook, and also turned his head toward Nistuin. The fast horses had a long start, but before they had climbed the eastward hill, Svegum needs must slack so as not to overtake them. He held back till they came to the turn above the woods at Maristun. Then he quit the road, and up the river flat he sped the book, a farther way, but the only way to bring them there ahead. Squeak, crack, squeak, crack, squeak, crack. At regular intervals from the great spreading snowshoes of the book, and the steady sow of his breath was like the Nordlan as she passes up the Hardungi Fjord. High up, on the smooth road to the left, they could hear the jingle of the horse bells and the shouting of Borgrevink's driver, who, under orders, was speeding hard for Nistuin. The highway was a short road and smooth, and the river valley was long and rough. But when, in four hours, Borgrevink got to Nistuin, there in the throng was a face that he had just left at Laudstolson. He appeared not to notice, though nothing ever escaped him. At Nistuin, none of the men would sign. Someone had warned them. This was serious, might be fatal at such a critical point. As he thought it over, his suspicions turned more and more to Svegum. The old fool that could not write his name at Laudstolson. But how did he get there before himself? with his speedy horses. There was a dance at Nistuin that night. The dance was necessary to mask the meeting, and during that, Borgrevink learned of the swift white wren. The Nistuin trip had failed, thanks to the speed of the white book. Borgrevink must get to Bergen before word of this, or all would be lost. There was only one way, to be sure of getting there before anyone else. Possibly, word had already gone from Laudstolson. But even at that, Borgervink could get there and save himself, at the price of all Norway, if need be, provided he went with the white storebook. He would not be denied. He was not the man to give up a point, though it took all the influence he could bring to bear this time to get Old Svegum's leave. The storebook was quietly sleeping in the corral when Svegum came to bring him. He rose leisurely, hind legs first, stretched one, then the other, curling his tail tight on his back as he did so, shook the hay from the great antlers as though they were a bunch of twigs, and slowly followed Svegum at the end of the tight halter. He was so sleepy and slow that Borgervink impatiently gave him a kick and got for response a short snort from the book, and from Svegum an earnest warning, both of which were somewhat scornfully received. The tinkling bells on the harness had been replaced, but Borgervink wanted them removed. He wished to go in silence. Svegum would not be left behind when his favorite wren went forth, so he was given a seat in the horse-sleigh, which was to follow, 
and the driver thereof received from his master a secret hint to delay. Then, with papers on his person to death doom a multitude of misguided men, with fiendish intentions in his heart, as well as the power to carry them out, and with the fate of Norway in his hands, Borgrevink was made secure in the sled behind the white storebuck, and sped at dawn on his errand of desolation. At the word from Svegum, the white wren set off with a couple of bounds that threw Borgrevink back in the pook. This angered him, but he swallowed his wrath on seeing that it left the horse sleigh behind. He shook the line, shouted, and the book settled down to a long swinging trot. His broad hoofs clicked double at every stride. His nostrils, out level, puffed steady blasts of steam in the frosty morning as he settled to his pace. The pook's prow cut two long shears of snow that swirled up over man and sled till all were white, and the great ox eyes of the king wren blazed joyously in the delight of motion, and of conquest too, as the sound of the horse bells faded far behind. Even masterful Borgrevink could not but mark with pleasure the noble creature that had balked him last night, and now was lending its speeds to his purpose, for it was his intention to arrive hours before the horse sleigh, if possible. Up the rising road they sped as though downhill, and the driver's spirits rose with the exhilarating speed. The snow groaned ceaselessly under the prow of the pulk, and the frosty, creaking under the hoofs of the flying wren, was like the gritting of mighty teeth. Then came the level stretch from Nistuin's hill to Dalikarls, and as they whirled by in the early day, little Carl chanced to peep from a window and got sight of the great white wren in a white pulk with a white driver, just as it is in the stories of the giants, and clapped his hands and cried, Good! Good! But his grandfather, when he caught a glimpse of the white wonder that went without even sound of bells, felt a cold chill in his scalp, and went back to light a candle that he kept at the window till the sun was high, for surely this was the storebook of Jotunheim. But the wren whirled on, and the driver shook the reins and thought only of Bergen. He struck the white steed with the loose end of the rope, the bulk gave three great snorts and three great bounds, then faster went, and, as they passed by Dioskul, where the giant sit on the edge, his head was muffled in scud, which means that a storm is coming. The store book knew it. He sniffed and eyed the sky with anxious look, and even slacked a little. But Borgervink yelled at the speeding beast, though going yet as none but he could go, and struck him once, twice, and thrice, and harder yet. So the pulk was whirled along like a skiff in a steamer's wake. But there was blood in the storebook's eye now, and Borgervink was hard put to balance the sled. The miles flashed by like roods till Svegum's bridge appeared. The storm wind now was blowing, but there was the troll, whence came he now, none knew, but there he was, hopping on the keystone, and singing of, Norway's fate, Norway's look, of the hiding troll in the riding book. Down the winding highway they came, curving inward as they swung around the corner. At the voice on the bridge, the deer threw back his ears and slackened his pace. Borgrevink, not knowing whence it came, struck savagely at the wren. The red light gleamed in those ox-like eyes. He snorted in anger and shook the great horns. But he did not stop to avenge the blow. For him was a vaster vengeance still. He onward sped as before, but from that time Borgrevink had lost all control. The one voice that the wren would hear had been left behind. 
they whirled aside off the road before the bridge was reached the pulk turned over but righted itself and borgervink would have been thrown out and killed but for the straps it was not to be so it seemed rather as though the every curse of norway had been gathered into the sled for a purpose bruised and battered he reappeared the troll from the bridge leaped lightly to the storbuck's head and held on to the horns as he danced and sang his ancient song and a new song too ah at last o oh, lucky day norway's curse to wipe away borgrevink was terrified and furious he struck harder at the storbuck as he bounded over the rougher snow and vainly tried to control him he lost his head in fear he got out his knife at last to strike at the wild book's hamstrings but a blow from the hoof sent it flying from his hand their speed on the road was slow to that they now made no longer striding at the trot but bounding madly great five stride bounds the wretched borgrevink strapped in the sled alone and helpless through his own contriving screaming cursing and praying the storbuck with bloodshot eyes madly steaming careered up the rugged ascent up to the broken stormy hoyfeld mounting the hills as a petrel mounts the rollers skimming the flats as a fulmar skims the shore he followed the trail where his mother had first led his tottering steps up from the von dom nook he followed the old familiar route that he had followed for five years where the white ringed reaper flies aside where the black rock mountains shining white come near and block the sky where the reindeer find their mystery on like the little snow wreath that the storm wind sends dancing before the storm on like a whirlwind over the shoulder of sulitand over the knees of tohomba the giants that sit at the gateway faster than man or beast could follow up 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 and on and no one saw them go but a raven that swooped behind and flew as raven never flew and the troll the same old troll that sang by the von dam and now danced and sang between the antlers good luck good luck for norway with the white storbuck comes riding over Tvinhau, they faded like flying scud on the moorlands on to the gloomy distance away toward jotunheim the home of the evil spirits the land of the lasting snow their every sign and trail was wiped away by the drifting storm and the end of them no man knows the norse folk awoke as from a horrid nightmare their national ruin was averted there were no deaths for there were no proofs and the tale-bearer's strife was ended the one earthly sign remaining from that drive is the string of silver bells that Svegum had taken from the storbuck's neck the victory bells each the record of a triumph won and when the old man came to understand he sighed and hung to the string a final bell the largest of them all nothing more was ever seen or heard of the creature who so nearly sold his country or of the white storbuck who balked him yet those who live near jotunheim say that on stormy nights when the snow is flying and the wind is raving in the woods there sometimes passes at frightful speed an enormous white reindeer with fiery eyes drawing a snow-white pulk in which is a screaming wretch in white and on the head of the deer balancing by the horns is a brown-clad white-bearded troll bowing 
and grinning pleasantly at him, and singing, Of Norway's look and a white store book, the same, they say, as the one that with prophetic vision sang by Svegums van Damme on a bygone day when the birches wore their springtime hangers and a great mild eye Varshimla came alone to go away with a little white renskov walking slowly demurely by her side end of section 16 end of animal heroes by ernest thompson seaton